Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, we've done the first nine chapters, and they are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So you can go back and uh, watch those there. Today I'm going to begin with chapter 10. And what I'm using is just uh, uh, Bible Gateway. Uh, I'm looking at it in the KJV first, since I am a KJV firstist. Um, and then I, I'm looking at it in the Amplified version because um, uh, it amplifies it. And you know, it may be helpful to me. So um, let's look at it first here, uh, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Well, you know, I am a father, and uh, I'm so thankful that my son is really very wise. Uh, I'm 64 years old, and my son's... Uh, 35 now and I uh, it, it, it is such a relief when you your children are wise and they don't do foolish things and I, I know I've met a lot of people over the years that have had uh, real problems with their children because their children have been foolish and that's really the the whole theme of the book of Proverbs uh, it uh, is a contrast between a foolish person and a wise person. What, what does a foolish person do compared to how, what does a wise person do? And when we do wise things, we get good results in our lives. When we do foolish things, then we suffer the consequences of the, the foolish acts. But when your children do foolish things, uh, it can be really heartbreaking. Uh, and so uh, if you teach your children from a young age to study Proverbs and learn wisdom, apply and they apply this to their lives, they make wise decisions in their lives. It is such a relief when your children do wise things instead of foolish things. So verse 1 it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father. And uh, it certainly applies to me. My son is wise, and I'm very glad. But a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Well, yeah, I think that the, the mother, of course, would be heartbroken. But uh, I think the fathers also would be very heartbroken if their children turned out to be uh, um, foolish. Let's look at this at the Amplified Version and see if we see any difference here says, the, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish and self-confident son is the grief of his mother. A foolish and self-confident son. Hmm. I don't know how they arrived at that. Um, does foolish mean that you're self-confident? Uh, uh, I made a video years ago and yeah, I think it uh, I think it, I removed it for some reason but it was talking about uh, self-consciousness versus Christ consciousness and uh, uh, the idea of um, being confident so people think self-confidence is a good thing but when you put your confidence in yourself um, we, we, uh, we're only fallible humans. And so then we will tend to make mistakes. And sometimes the mistakes are very serious. Uh, but if we put our confidence in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, put our confidence in Jesus to save us, and put our confidence in the Holy Spirit to transform us and lead us, uh, then, uh, we're going to be far better off. I mean, first of all, if you put your confidence in yourself for salvation, 
you won't go to heaven. You will suffer the second death in the lake of fire because you that's what salvation is based upon. Uh, no longer putting your confidence in yourself and your own ability to satisfy God, instead putting your confidence in Jesus. Uh, and there's the idea of self-reliance. Um, we don't want to rely upon ourselves. People think self-reliance is good, and, it, and I can understand that to a certain point. But really, we, we don't want to rely on ourselves for salvation. We need to rely on Christ to do the saving. Not don't rely on your your own ability. Um, so self confidence, self reliance, self esteem is another problem. Uh, we should not esteem ourselves. Scriptures talk about we all people think too highly of themselves. Uh, we should. You know, Proverbs also talks about some of these chapters we'll be coming to talking about a humble person versus a proud person, and self esteem is pride uh, and pride is the opposite opposite of humility so rather than esteeming ourselves we should give all the esteem to god all the glory to god this god that we worship is jesus christ our savior god uh, so uh, i don't know if uh, this should be in here in the amplified version as far as it says but a foolish and self-confident son is the grief of his mother but since we are talking about self-confidence, I thought that was important to uh, explain. Don't be a self-centered person, be a Christ-centered person. Verse two in the, in the uh, Amplified is, um, I mean, in the King James, is, treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Well, I want to look at that in the Amplified right away. No, that that is the Amplified. Let's go back to the KJV. Oops. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Hmm. All right. Let's try that in the Amplified then. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness, that is moral and spiritual rectitude in every area of and relation delivers from death. Well, I don't know if it's just death, what it's referring to, if it's just the, the mortal death of our body, uh, or it's talking maybe farther, much greater thing, which is the, the death of, the, uh, of our existence, the, uh, the death, the second death. Uh, but we should not even though it can be tempting to do a wicked thing and then somehow profit from it. If you think that you can profit from evil, like stealing uh, or like uh, larceny, uh, th th these things are evil, they're wicked, and you may think that you can get a profit from it, but this says it profits nothing. But righteousness uh, delivers from death. Okay, so let's look at the uh, KJV now. And go to verse 3. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Well, I, I hope you're understanding now why, uh, even though I'm a King James firstist, I always want to look at the King James first, but this uh, English language from the 17th century 
is not my native language by any means. And even though I, I trust that translation, and it's important because it has verses that some of the modern translations uh, don't have that are very important. So I, I always want to look at the King James Version first, and yet it's almost like, like a different language to me sometimes. And I'm, I'm an educated person. Uh, so um, I can probably understand it about as well as most people, but uh, and yet even I find it difficult at times. So it says, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. I'm going to have to look at that in the Amplified to make sense of it. And it says, the Lord will not allow the uncompromisingly righteous to famish. Okay. So you see now this, this is uh, giving me the exact 180 degree opposite uh, meaning than I thought it meant originally. The Lord will not allow the uncompromisingly righteous to famish. If, in other words, if you are uncompromising in your righteousness, if you will not compromise uh, to get ahead, uh, as it says in the other verse, in the previous verse, treasures of the wicked of wickedness profit nothing. So that would be like stealing, uh, larceny, embezzlement. These kinds of things are wicked. And you may think it prof profits you, but it really profits you nothing. It probably just end, you end up in jail. But it says, follow up to that, if you will not compromise on your righteousness, if you will continue doing the right thing instead of wicked things, then uh, it says the Lord will not allow you to famish. Famish means to go hungry, uh, to go without. But he thwarts the desire of the wicked. He thwarts the desires of the wicked. So if you choose, and by the way, you know, you do have a free will. I've uh, made extensive uh, teachings against Calvinism and the idea that um, man does not have a free will and, and Cal is taught in Calvinism. That's absolutely wrong. Uh, see my playlist, playlist of videos, Calvinism debunked, for more on that. But you, do, you have a free will. You can choose to do the right thing or you can choose to do the wrong thing. God's not making you do anything bad. Uh, the devil doesn't make you do anything bad. The, the, the devil or the demons, they may be tempting you, but you get to choose. And so if, if you choose to do the right things, the Lord says, you will not go hungry. You will not go without. But if you choose to do the wicked things, uh, God will thwart your, your, uh, your desires and your plan, and it will profit you nothing. So now we're going to look at... Uh, Verse four. Let's look at that in the in the KJV. I should have just copied these as I usually do. King James version. It's just scrolling back and forth like this. Uh, okay. He he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. <laughs> But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Okay. It's another thing I could certainly attempt to try to figure this out. Uh, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. What's a slack hand? I don't really know. I don't recognize that kind of phraseology at all. A slack hand is a loose hand, I guess. But he says, but the hand of the diligent make it rich. So if, you work, if your hand is diligent, work, continue working. If you work hard, you'll uh, succeed. If your hand is slack, in other words, if you're lazy, uh, you'll be poor. Now uh, let's see if the Amplified agrees with, with that. Let me copy and paste all this here into a, a page. It'll be easier for me. Okay, Proverbs chapter 10 in the KJV. Holy. Bear with me just one minute, please. Okay. 
Now let me copy and paste it in the Amplified. Amplified. First, let's look at verse 4 in the Amplified. It says, he becomes poor who works with a slack and idle hand. So I guess I figured that out correctly. Um, if you have an idle hand, if you don't work, if you work with, you know, without putting a real good effort in, you'll become poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. Um, you know, here in America, there's a big argument about, uh, is this still the land of opportunity? You know, I believe it is. I mean, look, look at, we, we even have uh, um, and Barack Obama as president. This, this shows you that you can be of any race and, and achieve the highest office in the country. Uh, we have people who are successful from all ethnicities, all races. Uh, it, it, the only thing that, that really will separate the successful from the unsuccessful is the, uh, the work ethic. And that's what this is talking about, uh, diligence. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. If you will be diligent, if you will continue working hard at, at succeeding in life, you will succeed. You won't have to be out there, uh, you know, in the street with a sign and begging. You know, you can succeed. And uh, there's countless tales of people who've come from uh, poor backgrounds, who've attained great successes in all, all types of, uh, you know, careers and, and uh, various endeavors of life that they've succeeded and reached the highest levels. It can be done. It's a question of you choosing with your free will to do the right thing and become a hard worker. Okay, I'm going to paste this uh, onto that page here. Okay, that'll be easier for me now. So now we'll go to uh, KJV um, Proverbs 10, verse 5. He who gathers in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. This is a uh, this, again, now we're talking about work ethic and being diligent, not being lazy, being a hard worker, and um, that's, that's what will give you success. And look at verse 5 in the Amplified. And it says, He who gathers in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Well, it's time to harvest and you're sleeping. That would be, I don't know, foolish. The word that Solomon likes to use is foolish or versus wise. But this stat sounds like even a step worse than foolish it sounds really stupid or extremely stupid extremely lazy when it's time to do the harvest that's when you really have to apply yourself and do the work uh, and i don't know what it really means he who gathers in the summer is a wise son i'm not a farmer i'm not used to the seasons i don't know the importance of of uh, the different seasons to farmers but it says he who gathers in summer is a wise son so uh, there's a certain time where you need to gather. Uh, it's the appropriate time, and if you're wise, you'll do it. And in, in, when it's time to harvest, you can't just stay in bed. you got to get out of bed and do your work. Uh, it, it, it's a shame if you'll be lazy and stay in bed and not work. Let's look at verse 6 in the KJV. Blessings are upon the head of the just. But violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Uh, this is something I've said numerous times. Uh, 
in this study of Proverbs is that you have to understand that um, the book of Proverbs is a, a collection of Proverbs or sayings. Sometimes a saying is one verse. Sometimes a saying is two or three or four verses together to make a point. Uh, but these sayings or Proverbs, uh, are, it's not a continuous story like we find in, let's say, the epistle to, to the Romans or uh, to Galatians or uh, the, the Gospel of John. These are stories that are giving us uh, uh, a, it's a, it's a history. It's an account of what happened in history uh, about people and the, 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 uh, the things that were done. Uh, or in Proverbs, that's not what it is at all. It's not a story. It's teachings. It's teaching certain ideas and uh, um, we want you to learn certain premise for, premises for your life. So here we have that just because it's chapter 10 doesn't mean the entire chapter is going to be expressing the same thing. After a verse or two or three, uh, Solomon writes, he continues writing about, uh, and now we're talking about something that seems to be completely different than the, the topic we just talked about. And uh, so you, you can't go look at chapter nine as well. Chapter nine is all about one thing. It, we may have two or three or four different themes within this chapter. So verse six says, blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. And in the Amplified, it says, blessings are upon the head of the uncompromisingly righteous. So when it says the just, the Amplified, it says that the just means that you are continuing to do the right things. You're uncompromisingly righteous. Righteous means you're doing the right things. And uh, if you're uncompromising about it, that means that you continue to do it. You do not compromise. So you get blessings if you continue doing the right thing. And it says, the upright in right standing with God, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Yeah, well, sometimes the wicked are just openly, uh, overtly violent. You can tell a, a mile away there's a violent person coming. And sometimes it, it's more concealed. Uh, and you don't find about their violence until, you know, they've, uh, they've kind of uh, got you relaxed and brought your guard down. Then the wickedness comes out and the violence. So verse seven in the KJV is the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Hmm. Well, there are people who, um, uh, it seems they really want to be remembered. Do you want to be remembered? Do I want to be remembered? Well, one of the reasons that I'm doing this right now and that I continue making videos and participating in YouTube and Google Plus uh, is not only for the immediate results where people can learn uh, and have fellowship, um, but, but I believe maybe very long after I am gone with the Lord that uh, these videos will continue to uh, help people. That's really all the videos are for, is to try to help people understand things, and sometimes to help me understand things. I'm not omniscient. I don't understand every single scripture. Uh, and sometimes by uh, having a, a group discussion with a 
right kind of people, people who are willing to uh, listen and, and share all kinds of ideas on these scriptures and are not going to be offended when someone has an interpretation that is different than theirs. Uh, when, when we do have these dialogues, these discussions, these uh, Bible studies together, uh, it's a chance for all, all of us to learn. So uh, I'm doing this because I, I want to continue learning. I want you to learn. And then once I'm gone, this can be here continuing. Not in so much remembrance of me. I, I guess, in all honesty, I mean, I have to admit that I, I would like to be remembered. Uh, I'd like to be remembered by, you know, my family for generations and, uh, and also by you for uh, the, any friends I have through, through this ministry. I'd like to be remembered. Uh, but this is, says, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. So if we do the right things, uh, you know, our memory, the memory of us will be, continue to be good memories. We will be respected and loved, and revered uh, by some. Uh, but if, if we're wicked, the memories will rot. We'll either fade away into nothing and be forgotten, or maybe we will be remembered for the bad things, and that is uh, what you call, you know, there's a person can be famous or they can be infamous. If we're famous, uh, yeah, there's no negative connotation, but if we're infamous, that means we're well known for something bad. And that is what this person is. It says, the name of the wicked shall rot. Okay, let's look at verse 8 in the KJV. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let's look at verse 7, continue that in the Amplified. The memory of the uncompromisingly righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked shall rot. And then verse 8 is, The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Jack Smack, where are you? Prating. I don't know what prating means. And as I said, you know, I, you know, I'm a college graduate. I've had continuing education for much of my life. I'm, uh, but and yet, look at these words. And I find words throughout the KJV. I don't know what prating means. Um, Jack Smack has the greatest vocabulary of any person I've ever known personally. This vocabulary far exceeds anybody I've ever known. So he would foolish of lips will fall headlong. The foolish of lips will fall headlong. The foolish of lips, that's the prating. The prating fool, the prating fool is the foolish of lips, uh, according to the, uh, um, uh, the Amplified. So the foolish of lips, I guess that would be the speak person that's always saying stupid things. And if we're always opening up our mouth and saying foolish or stupid things, you know, we will fall. It doesn't take long for people to recognize that you're a fool. <laughs> There's some point in Proverbs we'll come to sometime, one of these chapters talking about how.
Hmm. So very weird what I'm seeing here on the screen. It's uh, I don't even know if I'm still operating. Well, that's uh, camera. All right, I think I have it working properly now. All right, so if you're wise in heart, you will receive commandments. Uh, you'll be willing to follow the commandments of God. God doesn't give us commandments because he wants to be harsh and make a lot of rules and make life that difficult. He gives us commandments because if you do follow the commandments, your life will be better. Uh, let's see. Uh, now let's look at this uh, verse. Let's look at verse 9. Uh, he that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. And in the Amplified it says, he who walks uprightly walks securely. Walking uprightly means is that uh, you're you're doing the right things. You're you're uh, not you're uncompromisingly doing the right things, as I said earlier. Uh, he who walks uprightly walks securely. Securely means that you're not going to have a bad fall. By, by fall, it doesn't mean to fall down and you know break your hip. It means you will fall in terms of um, you know, let's say your reputation will be ruined, your relationships, friendships will be ruined, your family will be ruined. All kinds of things can be ruined if you fall uh, because you did unrighteous things, you did wicked things. But if you continue walking uprightly, you'll be secure. But he who takes a crooked way shall be found out and punished. Yeah, no, I mean, you might be able to get away with some things in life, uh, and you won't be discovered by uh, your family or friends or community or, you know, city, state, federal government. Maybe you can get away with some things, but you cannot hide from God. God sees everything you do. Nothing's done in secret that God is, doesn't observe. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So everything you do, God's watching. Everything you say, God's listening. Even everything you think, God knows. God knows your mind and your heart. So you're, you're not going to really be able to uh, uh, not be found out. He says, but he who takes a crooked way shall be found out and punished. Well, first you could be punished by the local authorities, you go to jail. You could also be punished by your spouse. You know, if you do something bad and you get caught, Maybe you'll be punished by your spouse, or maybe there'll be a divorce. Uh, there's, and then, of course, in terms of sin and how God sees it, is that sin separates us from God. You can't have a relationship with God because of sin. But the good news is Jesus paid for all your sins and all your wickedness. So sin is not going to prevent you from being with God and going to heaven because of Jesus, provided provided you did the one thing God does require of you, and that is put your faith in Jesus for your salvation and do not put your confidence in yourself, as I said earlier. Salvation is confidence in Jesus, not self-confidence. Um, but don't think you're going to get away with things and not ever be discovered if you decide to do the wrong things. Look at verse 10 in the KJV. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. Okay, I know what a prating fool is now. 
uh, person who's speaking foolish things, can't keep his mouth shut. There's always something stupid, foolish coming out of their mouth. Uh, okay, the prated fool shall fall. He that winketh with the eye causes sorrow. Winketh with the eye. Does that mean that you're just winking at something and saying, well, I'm just going to ignore that and not, not stand up against it? Let's see what the Amplified says. Verse 10. He who winks with the eye, that is, craftily and with malice, causes sorrow. Hmm. So if you are uh, winking at things, in other words, uh, you're just saying, ah, oh, that's okay, you're, you're rationalizing. Uh, it's like, uh, what is the term that's popular today? Moral relativity. Oh, that's okay. Don't let's not judge on that. No, there are certain things the scriptures tell us are right, and certain things are wrong. It's black and white. It's not gray. It's not morally relative. And we can't just wink at things and act like, oh, it's okay. And it says, and if you're craftily and with malice, have malice, then you cause sorrow. But the foolish of lips will fall headlong, but he who boldly reproves makes peace. He who boldly reproves makes peace. Reprove, that means to point out to someone else that they're wrong. Uh, so we, we do need to stand up to things that are wrong instead of winking at them and ignoring things that are wrong. Uh, let's look at verse 11 in the KJV. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. I think when it says the mouth, it, maybe it means the words that come out of the mouth. But the violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. But violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. <laughs> okay, let's look at verse 11 in the Amplified. The mouth of the uncompromising righteous man is a well of life. Well, that doesn't help me that much uh, because uh, it says the mouth. I don't think uh, this proverb is saying that the literal mouth, the opening that we uh, put food in and and speak out of, that that's uh, what it's referring to, that particular part of our body. I think it's the mouth that probably refers to the words that come out of the mouth. Uh, the words that come out of the mouth of the righteous man is a well of life. But the mouth of the wicked man conceals violence. So I would say that the words that come out of a wicked man conceals violence. And that's what I said earlier about a wicked man sometimes is not uh, uh, um, obvious. They're, they may be more clever and, and, and sneaky. Uh, so let's look at uh, verse 12 in the KJV. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. Wow. Well, hatred stirreth up strifes. Well, I, I've, I've certainly uh, seen a lot of strife in life. And also certainly here on YouTube, I've seen a lot of strife. Sometimes it's between unbelievers and believers. But sadly, many times it's between believer and believer. There's strife. And this verse says, hatred stirreth up strife. Well, I don't know if all strife is comes as 
rooted in hatred. But if you do have hatred, then more than likely you will be stirring up strife. I have some people in mind right now that have been doing this recently, but I'd like to keep this on the, the subject rather than the people, the individuals. If you have hatred in your heart, then you're going to be causing trouble. You'll be a troublemaker. You'll try. You'll be causing strife and divisions within the community of believers. But love covers all sins. Verse 12 in the Amplified says, Hatred stirs up contentions, but love covers all transgressions. You know, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And um, most people who are with, under this umbrella of Christianity, most of them are, are, I don't believe are really are Christians. A Christian is just a person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. Their salvation is not based on any personal merit, but instead is based only upon trusting Jesus to do the saving because he died for our sins. And he promises life everlasting if we'll trust him completely. But uh, so many of the people who are under this umbrella of Christianity don't believe that at all. They believe that salvation is um, also personal merit factors in. And uh, you, Jesus did his part, but you've got to do your part too. And that I, I've made countless videos proving that wrong. It's very easy to prove it wrong. But uh, um, love, um, love covers uh, all transgressions. Love covers a multitude of sins. Well, it's not always easy for us to love each other. Jesus said it's easy to get yoked to him. My yoke is easy. All you got to do is trust Jesus completely for your salvation. Acknowledge that you cannot do anything to get saved. And that's why you need him to do it for you. And once you believe that, you get yoked to Jesus. It's easy. Now, he says my burden is light. So there is a burden afterwards. And the, the burden is light. He doesn't give us 613 laws to follow as they did in Judaism. He gives us one law. He said, will you just love each other? Love each other. That's all. That's a light burden. Is that too much to ask? And yet, <laughs> it's, uh, I, sometimes I see a great lacking of love within, within this Christian community. Um, let's go to verse 13 in the KJV. 13. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. <laughs> wow. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back. A rod on your back, a beating, if you don't understand. In other words, if you're wise and you're doing the right things, you're going to be blessed. If you're foolish and you do the wrong things and you're wicked, you're going to have to suffer the consequences. Let's look at this in the verse 13 in the Amplified. 
on the lips of him who has discernment, skillful and godly wisdom is found. But discipline and the rod are from the back of him who is without sense and understanding. On the lips of him who has discernment, discernment. That's something I see very lacking too within this Christian community. Discernment. That's, uh, for example, someone asked me a question about the Bible. And uh, I have to discern, is this a legitimate question? Sometimes you see right away just from the type of question it is that it's uh, it's not a legitimate question. They're just trying to want to argue. They want to be insulting. Uh, and, and Okay, so if, if I discern first that it's a legitimate question, and then I try to answer it, and I get a reaction back to them, I have to discern, okay, is this person listening, or are they just there to argue? And as Jesus said, do they have ears to hear? If not, then they are what Jesus calls swine. Don't continue casting the pearls to the swine, Jesus said. Once we discern that they're not listening, move on and find someone else who will listen, who wants the good news, who is seeking the truth. And, and, and invest your time in them. Time is precious. Don't waste it on the swine, on the foolish people. And that's what discernment is, making these judgments. And I see a lot of people wasting time because they haven't discerned well. They haven't judged that this person is swine. Let's not, I don't want to keep on dealing with them. If their hearts ever change and they get back to me with a different attitude, then of course I want to, I want to tell them the good news. I want to answer their questions. <laughs> But the discipline of the ant and the rod are for the back of him who is not who is without sense and understanding. So if you if you're fool, you don't have understanding, and you're doing wicked things, uh, you're going to be punished either either by uh, your friends, by your community, by the law. In some way, you will be discovered and you will be punished. And that's what the rod represents. Thirteen in the 14 in the, in the uh, KJV. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Why, wise men lay up knowledge. Well, I think I have a certain degree of wisdom, but I don't claim that I'm all that wise. I, I can't, uh, I can't boast in that way. I, I, I think I've still done some foolish things, even some foolish things uh, recently. That in hindsight, I thought, wow, I shouldn't have done that. So I'm not completely wise. But um, I think I am wise, and I hope you will be wise in this, and that is the desire of knowledge. It says, wise men lay up knowledge. That's one of the things that is one of the great pleasures in my life, is learning something, gaining knowledge. And that's why I've um, adopted the... Um, the philosophy that uh, I want to listen to people who disagree. Now, you, if you disagree on the gospel and on salvation, then I, I want to try to teach you, and correct you, and lead you to Jesus Christ for salvation. If I discern that you, you don't have ears to hear, then I'll move on to find someone else. But assuming that you've already believed the right thing for salvation, and then we're talking about a hundred other things in the scriptures, like, like this book of Proverbs or anything else. Uh, I want to hear people who interpret it differently, who see it differently, have a different, uh, you know, many different theological questions. There's two or three camps, groups of people that 
say, well, I will see this particular subject this way. Another group of people say, oh, no, I, I see it this way. Sometimes there's a third way. Now, whatever camp you fall in, I want to learn all the different viewpoints in all the various camps. Because I've learned years ago that some of my original conclusions uh, were without support. There, there was nothing really backing it up. When I was willing to look at the other camp, the other viewpoints, I saw that there was the weight of the evidence on that other side was more convincing. I moved into the other camp. Now, if I didn't desire knowledge, that never would have happened. So sometimes we gain knowledge and we do not move to a different camp because even though we know more about it, we, we, we still believe that that viewpoint is incorrect. But it never hurts anybody to gain more knowledge. The more knowledge we have, the better equipped we, we are in answering other people's questions. And, uh, so, it says, the wise men lay up knowledge. So I hope you'll be wise and continue listening to all viewpoints of theology and gain more knowledge but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Again, the mouth of the foolish, the people who continue to be, say foolish things, uh, they're near destruction. Sometimes they're, they are destroyed, sometimes it's just inevitable. They're going to be destroyed. So there's going to be something bad happen because of their foolish mouth. Let's look at verse 14 in the Amplified. Wise men store up knowledge in mind and heart, but the mouth of the foolish is a present destruction. Hmm. So they're saying that even right now, the foolish person is in a state of destruction because of their foolishness and their, the foolish things that they're saying. Let's look at verse 15 in the KJV. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Well, I certainly don't want to try to explain that verse. Let's look at the Amplified. Maybe it can help me. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Uh, so if a person is rich, it's like their wealth provides them this, like a strong city. And so it's, it's, he's in a position of strength because he's wealthy. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Yeah. So someone who is poor, how can they exist in a state of poverty? They either don't continue existing because they, they starve or they get sick because they don't have enough to even take care of their health uh, or uh, they uh, their poverty is uh, they can't have a very good quality of life I've never felt that I was poor at any point in my life I I grew up in a middle class family and uh, I've always been had a, a middle class type of income. At one point I did acquire um, uh, more wealth um, and now in this retired, these retirement years, you know, I'm, I'm just have a nice, comfortable, easy retirement, but I, I've never had to suffer under poverty. I was wondering where my next meal was going to come to, if I had a place to sleep, a roof over my head. And so poverty is, is the ruin. But most people don't need to be poor because uh, they're probably there because of bad decisions. Now, there are people that are victims of circumstances. 
but if they're a victim of circumstances and they and yet they are wise uh, they will rebound because they'll make wise decisions so they don't remain in poverty okay i'm going to do verse 16 that will be the midway point in this chapter uh, and i'll do the second half of the chapter next time uh, let's look at verse 16 in the kjv the labor of the righteous tendeth to life the fruit of the wicked to sin the labor that's the work the righteous people, the people who continue for trying to do the right things, and their work it tends to life. They, they have a life that's worth living. They have prosperity. And they have blessings because they've done the right things and they've worked at it. The fruit of the wicked to sin. So when people have wickedness in them, their heart is wicked, they have wicked thoughts, and it leads them to do wicked things, to sin. Verse 16 in the Amplified. The earnings of the righteous, that's the upright in right standing with God, leads to life, but the profit of the wicked leads to further sin. Okay. Um, I think that uh, when I'm doing this uh, study by myself, I think one hour is about the limit of what I want to do. So I guess at the midway point, and I'll end this study after and pick up in verse 17 next Wednesday. <clears throat> but uh, as I do in all uh, these broadcasts, I want to end by uh, telling you the most important thing, the most important thing I have to say. The most important thing that we find in this book. You can read from cover to cover, but there's one thing that is of utmost importance. And that is, what do I have to do so I can go to heaven? Most of the world thinks they go to heaven because they've earned it. God judges their life, and uh, he puts their good deeds and bad deeds on a scale. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, the scale tilts in their favor, and they qualify for heaven based on personal merit. But that is foolishness. Scriptures say that we all fall short of the glory of God. The measuring of God is not a scale, so that 51% tilts the scale in your favor. You couldn't even pass your final exam in high school with just 51% correct. When you say, well, you're a lot better than that. Your you're good and bad is, your ratio is better than 51, 49. You're, you're, let's say you're 90% good. 90% is not good enough. No, you're better than that. 99% good. Almost everything you do in life is good, but you can't admit that at least on some occasions you've done the wrong things. You've done things that God would not be pleased about. These are things in the Bible calls sin. Bad thoughts, bad actions, sometimes failing to do a good thing. All these things are sin. So we, we look at our good deeds and our, and our sin and measure it out and you say you're 99 percent good well i've got bad news for you the bible says you've got to be perfect that's 100 percent good and zero sin that's the level that's the standard jesus christ set the standard god said man can't live up to this standard every man fails to a certain extent. Some do better than others, but we all fall short, the scriptures say. And that's why God decided that he needed to come to our rescue and save us. And God decided that he would become a man. This man is named Jesus. 
Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah, the Savior, the Messiah, the promised one from the scriptures. Throughout the scriptures, it promises that God will provide a Savior for mankind. And that's what he did. He became a man named Jesus. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He showed us the standard of perfection. And he said, if you can live up to this level, then you get to go to heaven. But if you feel sh fall short, if you're just 95% good, but just a little short, you failed. And if you can admit that it's impossible for you to be 100% perfect, if you can admit that, then you can also understand that you need Jesus. Jesus said, when Jesus was asked, um, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, well, with man it is impossible. So get that through your head now. With man it is impossible to be saved based upon your own merit. And Jesus said, with God all things are possible. So if you don't rely on yourself to get to heaven, but you rely on Jesus instead, then it's possible. Then it's even more than possible. It is assured. It's a promise. So Jesus came to this world and became a man so that he could die. As God, he couldn't die. He had to become a man so he could die in our place. He suffered and died on the cross. He paid for all of our sins. That's what the scriptures say. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He paid for the sins of every person. Your sins are paid for. Now, this is not a problem. How you measure up. You're not going to be judged upon how you measure up. You're going to be judged upon, did you accept the gift of salvation from Jesus or not? Did you believe in Jesus? The question was asked in the scriptures, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all it said. It doesn't say you've got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all these things, and then you can be saved. It says simply, believe on Jesus. So all you've got to do to get yoked to Jesus is believe on him. Put your faith in him, not yourself. And then after that, all he asks of us, will you just love each other? The scriptures say we should love God and we should love each other. That's what you should do. What you must do is trust Jesus. Put all your confidence in Jesus. No more self-confidence. Admit that you can't do it and you need him. I hope you do that. In every instant that you do put your faith in Jesus, then he gives you eternal life at that very instant. It's instantaneous and it's eternal. You can, you can never lose it. You cannot lose your salvation because Jesus promised it to you and he never breaks his promises. Uh, you, you, you can't lose it because it's a gift he gives you and the scripture says he doesn't take back his gifts. So once you put your faith in him, the scripture says he has you in the palm of his hand. Even if you want to let go, he won't let go of you. He has you securely. He says, I hold you in the palm of my hand. No one can pluck you out. I will never leave you or forsake you. That should give you a great joy to know that your place in heaven is assured. If you do put your faith in Jesus today, please make a comment on this video. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Thank you for watching. See you next Wednesday for part two of chapter nine. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.